Good morning, church. It's great to see you, and I'm glad to be here. Um, we are, we are uh, going to enjoy our heart for the house, but let me just say, if you're here and you're a guest, you get a free pass today, because this is a family talk. So if you're a guest, you just enjoy the environment, the atmosphere, you can listen in, but know that I'm talking to the family today, our family, the one who uh, has been here long enough to understand our heart, knows why we do what we do. In fact, all year long, we prioritize the world we prioritize the global needs, um, and we prioritize the outreach of our church and ministry all around us. But once a year, we prioritize the house. We take a moment, we pause, and we say, this week, everything that we give is going to go for the house. It's Heart for the House Sunday, and um, anything you designate to the end of the year is also for Heart for the House if you designate it that way. And This is an annual event for us where every year around this time, we take up a special offering through a special season toward the end of the year. And so I want to thank you, those of you who have been tracking with us. You may already be prepared for Heart for the House. It's a part of your giving. It's part of what you do. But this year, it's extra special because this year, it's our 100th anniversary. And that's really exciting. And we just determined that we couldn't celebrate one Week We had to celebrate three weeks. So this is the third week of celebrations of our, our 100th anniversary. And, and we started with kind of looking back about honoring the past. And, then, and that was two weeks ago. And I want to thank you all for coming. And it was, it was wonderful, beautiful service, beautiful packed house, two services in the morning. And then our, our Sunday evening was just, was just overflow. It was amazing. And then, um, and then last week was our conference weekend, and that was about embracing the present. So celebrating the past, honoring the past, embracing the present. And now today we're here with a, with a thought on building the future, building the future. So yeah, honor the past, embrace the present, build the future. That's been our theme. And so we're on that third week now, and it's been interesting. I think there's a spiritual principle that runs alongside of those three priorities. We're gonna see it in scripture in just a minute. But I really think it works like this. When you choose honor, you build unity. Did you know that? When you choose honor, you build unity. In other words, we say preference goes to you, I'm, I'm honoring you, and that brings us together. That creates unity. And then when unity is present, oh, when unity is present, the Bible says it's like in, in Psalm 133, it's like, it's like a blessing that just pours out. Unity brings a blessing. And so when we think about unity, I think unity actually leads us into encounter. And so we had this time of building unity through honor two weeks ago. And then last week we had this awesome experience of, of encounter. It's been a beautiful time for encounter, not just remembrance, but encounter. And, and here's the third piece of that is I think that encounter gives birth to generosity. Why? Because he's been so good to us. Amen. He's just been so good. And so we just want to celebrate his goodness. And, and so we're kind of using a question to, to undergird our thoughts today. And it's this, how can we build a legacy, a legacy through our church that will outlast us? Because that's what we've experienced. You realize that we're standing in someone else's, we are someone else's legacy. Did you know that? Coastline Church today in 2023 is legacy, legacy from others. Those who founded this place are no longer here, but we are. And again, this is a spiritual principle. So we see it in the life of scripture. And I actually want to help you see it today from the uh, story of the Israelites leaving Egypt. So if you think about this, they were in slavery for 400 years. Moses is the, um, is the, um, the deliverer of the people, he brings them out. And as he brings them out, he brings them out, not just in pieces or in parts. If you remember Pharaoh at different times when he didn't like one of the plagues, he would say, okay, you, some of you can go. And, and Moses always said, no, we all have to go. Why? They needed to go out in unity. They needed to go out together. They needed to go out as one force. And so they did. And after they went out, didn't they encounter God? Wow, did they ever encounter God? They encountered his power when he parted the Red Sea. 
they encountered his provision when he provided water from the rock and manna, uh, you know, uh, manna for them to eat. And they also really encountered his presence because there was a cloud that covered them each day and a pillar of fire each night. And so they encountered God, came out in unity, encountered God, and then Moses calls them to generosity. And that's what we're going to look at in Exodus 35 and then in Exodus 36. Moses called them to give. And it's, it's a really beautiful story. I'm really thrilled to share it with you. Exodus 35, verses 4 and 5, we're going to look at together. It says, Moses said to the whole Israelite community, gathered all of them together, this is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, you understand, it starts with what you have, not what you don't have. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring the Lord an offering of gold, silver, and bronze. And everyone who was willing, this is verse 21, and whose heart moved them, came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting. You know, this, these two verses start to tell a story. Moses said, listen, God's going to move in your heart. There's going to be a willingness in your heart, and you're going to respond out of that willingness. And as you do, something incredible is going to happen. And so everyone who was willing started to give. I love this picture because God is telling them through Moses, I want you to build a dwelling place for me. But who's he talking to? Homeless, traveling slaves. That's who he's talking to. They don't have a home of their own, and yet God calls them to prioritize his dwelling place. I just think there's something powerful about this. God called them, these slaves, to build a dwelling place for his presence. But he didn't just call them, he equipped them to do it. And that's what's so powerful here. You might be asking, well, where did a bunch of Hebrew slaves get all this stuff that they were supposed to give to the temple. It wasn't just gold and silver. It was also, you know, cloth and yarn and different stuff to make garments and curtains and all kinds of, all kinds of different things that they had in their possession. But how did they get all this resource? You ready for it? God gave it to them. That's how. You see, because they had to go out in unity, like I said, and when they finally went out in unity, there was, there was such a passionate desire on the part of the Egyptians to see them leave and such a passionate desire for them to bless them, like Israelites bless us so that God will stop all of this stuff that's been going on, all these plagues and all this, you know, now the death of the firstborn, all that. Please just take this stuff. Let us give you gold. Let us give you silver. And so literally when the Israelites left, they plundered Egypt. They came out with all of this stuff. They came out with all of these resources. They had it all with them. And so God gave them the resources. And then right here, we see him saying, now I want you to give some of it back. Give some of it back. This is probably the healthiest view that you can have on finances. Understand this. You are a steward, not an owner. You get it? You're a steward, not an owner. In other words, it's all God's, and he gives it to you, and you're responsible for it. And at times, God will ask you for some of what belongs to him. Amen? Some of you might say, well, no, no, it's my money. I worked hard for it. I understand why you might think that way, but please just back up. Take a bigger view on things. You're breathing his air. You're living on his earth. You're using his materials. Not only that, he gave you your brain. He gave you your business sense. He gave you your ability to put two and two together. He gave you everything that you have. It's all his. And at times, he says, hey, look what I've given you. I would like that portion back because I want to use it for my glory and for your good. And so th this is one of those moments. Um, and wow, did they ever give. It's actually a shocking story. 
Um, it, it's, it's amazing to read. Um, and so I want to look at it with you. So we're just going to go to the very next chapter. So they did it. All the willing hearts, they started giving. People started to give. And then it says this, then Moses gave an order and they sent this word throughout the camp. Like it's literally like tell everybody, spread the word. And here's the order. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. <laughs> I asked Pastor Ron in the first service, I said, Pastor Ron, you, you were the lead pastor here for 25 years. Did you ever stand up at any point and go, church, it's just too much. We don't know what to do with the piles of money. We have no idea. You're just going to have to stop giving. Um, he just smiled. You know, that's he just smiled. Uh, and the truth is, there's something shocking and beautiful about this, and it's very challenging as an example of the willingness of being prepared to build into God's house. It's a really beautiful thing. You know, we've been in this season where even through conference, we've been talking about immeasurably more, and I, I just think, wow, this is an immeasurably more kind of moment. And um, I have this, you know, this, this imagine thought. Imagine um, that was the next testimony that came out of Coastline. And it's like, Pastor Andy actually had to restrain the people from giving because it was just too much. You're, you're smothering me here, okay? Like, just too much, right? Uh, I'm, I'm being playful, but I do believe that the Holy Spirit is at work that we're encountering him in such a lovely way, beautiful way, and that he's putting a willingness in our hearts, a willingness in our hearts to give. And, and, and we feel a heart for the house. That's what this, this season is all about. And you want to see God's house strong. You want to see it built. You want to see it refreshed. You want to see it useful for the next generation. And God will bless that when that willingness is there, when that heart is there. That's why we call it heart for the house. It's a willingness. It's my heart. And this is why I believe that, because um, Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians, for if the willingness is there, the gift is ex acceptable. And I love the caveat that he puts on here, and this is a really important piece for all of us who are here. According to what one has, not according to what one does not have. It, some of you are positioned to give, and some of you are not, and that's okay. That's okay. Because I believe there's enough resource in the house for what the house needs. I really believe that. This is an act of faith. But if you have something to give, let it be a willing gift. Let it be something that you give. And there's such an, an acceptable nature to that kind of gift. But the example that we can take from the Israelites isn't over. In fact, I've often said that the Old Testament shows us humanity. The New Testament shows us God's love and redemption. But the Old Testament really shows us us. It's like a mirror. And so we can learn so much in terms of example from the Old Testament. You see, what, what I want to do is I want to take you back now. Take you back to chapter 32. And in chapter 32, we see something that happens with the same kind of material uh, that what we, you know, comparative to what we just read in 35 and 36. And so this was beforehand, okay? And so in this scenario, we see a different way that people use that resource that God had given them. And so Moses had gone up to the mountain to get the word from God, to get the law, to get the Ten Commandments from God. And he was gone too long, according to some of the people. They were worried. They became afraid. They actually started to fear. They were worried. They didn't know where he had gone. Was he ever going to come back? Are we stuck here in the wilderness? And they started to say, maybe we should go back to Egypt. And in all of this, Aaron was in charge. That was Moses' brother. And he got scared. And he thought, what am I going to do? They're all going to abandon us. They're all going to leave. They're, they're fearful. They're pressuring me. What am I supposed to do? And so Aaron responded in fear to the fear of the Israelites. Does anybody see a problem here? When you respond in fear, you're not going to respond according to faith. And so Aaron, in fear, responded to their fear, and together they sinned grievously. And I want to read that with you in Exodus 32. 
So Aaron answered them. Okay, you're all unsettled. Listen, take off the gold earrings. Remember we were talking before about what they did with their gold and their silver. Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods. They all said this as a community. These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. This is an example of idol worship, the creation of an object to worship other than God. Not only that, they gave those idols a title of deliverer that belonged to the true God. This was a grievous sin. But there's a lesson for us, even as we sit here today in this, and the lesson is about what we do with what God gives us if we respond with fear. And here we see clearly what happens if we use our resources out of fear. And some of us have failed to give to God's house because we're afraid. We're afraid of what's happening in the world. We're afraid of the markets. We're afraid of the interest rates. But let me tell you this. If you clutch what you have in fear, it will become a snare to you. It will become a snare to you. God wants you to respond in faith and not in fear. That is a biblical truth. He wants us to respond in faith, not in fear. And I feel like what God is growing in some of us and what we need to say, we actually need to say it, is that I'm willingly going to give to God's house because I refuse to let the resources that God gave me be turned into an idol. I'm going to refuse that. That's not going to happen because, see, you'll either use what God gives you to build the kingdom Or you will keep it for yourself and you'll run the risk of building an idol. And, you know, Jesus picks up on this in the New Testament, the same concept. And he teaches that, you know, your heart directs your money. It's actually what's going on in your heart. He says it this way, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I say it this way, where your money flows, your love grows. Where your money flows, your love grows. And why do I say it that way? Why do I say that? Because your treasure reveals what you love. But here's the good news. You ready for this? The good news is, is you can choose to put your money into the places where you want your love to go. You don't have to just say, oh boy, obviously I love that. That's where all my money goes. You can say, no, no, no. I don't want to love that. I want to love this. And I'm going to put my money there. And let me tell you what that, that teaches us is that investment grows passion. When I invest, it leads to passion. I may not start with passion, but I know that's right. I know that's what God wants. I know that's God's good for my life. And so I'm going to invest in it. Think about it. When you invest in something, your passion for it grows. You want to learn a new sport, you're going to have to invest in it. You have to get a new set of golf clubs. If you want to play that terrible game that makes you very angry all the time. (laughs) Right? No, really, I'm just making a joke. But the point is, is that you can't do something without, you know, that gets in your heart that you're passionate about without investing in it. And investment leads to passion. It's quite beautiful. And we've had a passion at the church here. We've had a passion for Vancouver Island to reach this community, to reach the city, to touch the island, to plant churches, to multiply. But the thing that we've always said, and anybody who's been here um, as long as I have been would agree with me, we're never stronger out there than we are here. So this house matters. This is a hub. This is a ministry center. This is a broadcast location. This is, this is a, a foundation from which we spring forward with strength. And so we're committed We're committed to making the church strong and healthy. And we've discerned a need, a need that's present in our community, a need that we feel positioned to meet. There are many, many families who we are still yet to meet. There are precious little children being born today who we have no relationship with, and we'd like to create a better bridge, a further bridge. And so we have prioritized in this phase of our construction our daycare, which is scheduled to open in January. And that daycare is going to service as many as 100 families. And we're going to meet parents and children who we never would have met otherwise. We're going to have Christian teachers, Christian curriculum, 
And that Christian curriculum is linked to our Sunday curriculum. And so the hope is, is that we're going to see many precious little ones come, be a part of the preschool, learn about Jesus, learn about his love, and also families that we can love on and minister to. And so we're really excited about this phase of the construction, and it's attached to vision. You know, what's funny is that I've been lead pastor for over nine years, and, and I'm in my 10th season and a lot of things, and I looked back and I said, you know, for every one of those years, we have always been under construction. We've never not been building something or fixing something or remodeling something, and I want to apologize if that's my fault. Probably is, but it's, you know, we just have a vision to make the church a vibrant place for people to be. And so you may be wondering, well, what have you been doing over the last 10 years? Well, I want you to know, you know, you as a church have really been the ones who have done it. I mean, we've, we've done the work and we've commissioned the laborers and the workers, but I want you to know it's been you, your resources that have kept the vision moving. And so we've completed our basement renovation, new foundations, new beams, new kids and youth classrooms, new youth center, new sets of washrooms, new kitchen, all on the bottom level over there. And then we did the nursing mother's room and the nursery facility, which is right here. And then we did the new corridor between the buildings and the glass curtain wall and the new washrooms. Praise the Lord for washrooms. <laughs> and then we started out on this Caledonia Street corridor, a new corridor there, new entrance, complete atrium space, um, mezzanine, coffee bar, all of that's been done. Are you enjoying that space? Isn't it nice to have a place to be together? We also did work on the exterior and in the parking lot. It's all been great. And now we're into this new phase. And this new phase has the daycare right in the middle of it. But on both ends, there's spaces that we will be the ones who only use. We'll use the daycare space for our preschool classrooms during the weekends. But on the end, there's a beautiful new check-in center being built. And on the other end is a multi-purpose room. This multi-purpose room has a kitchen, has bathrooms. It's going to be our college classroom. It's going to be our evening classes. It's going to be a place for grow track and baptisms and many, many other things. It's actually beautiful, beautiful space. Not to mention a brand new fully enclosed playground space that we can use on the weekends. That's for the daycare. So this is a really exciting phase. And in each phase, what we've discovered is that it increases our impact and our outreach, it deepens our fellowship and our connection as a body, and it drastically improves our facility. And we're seeing the evidence of that. But this is important, friends. We've done all of that without stopping our missions work, our outreaches locally, um, and we keep expanding that to open up a farm this year and meet the need of the street with our mini markets and so on. And not to mention all the dollars gone over Overseas, And so we haven't stopped those good works in order to do this. And that's because you've been able to help us do that. And so we're in, we're in phase number five right now, really. And it needs to be completed by January, because by the end of the year, because in January we open the daycare. And we have families that are on hold waiting for us. And so here's the problem. The problem is we have a funding gap. And we need your help. We need your help immediately. I usually don't have this, this compelling of a ask at Heart for the House. It's just I say, let's just give and God will help us with what we're doing next. But this is a compelling ask. And the reason why is because when we started this phase, we had $250,000 from Heart for the House that you gave in years past to start the project. Then we secured, through the help um, of many in our church, one particular, we secured $1.45 million from the government in a grant for building the preschool space, which is pretty awesome, for building the daycare. And so we had this money on hand, and we were very excited. We started the project. We get moving, and we're now a million dollars into that renovation. But the problem has been we've only received 30% of the money from the government, the reason why is because they have markers that we must meet in order for funds to be released. So there's a gap in the funding. We have $700,000 waiting for us if we can get to 90% finished. But in order to get to 90% finished, guess how much money we need? $700,000. And so we're in this gap time. That's real money. So we sat together with the leadership team and, and um, we said, we gotta, we gotta solve this. This is our job. We're, this is on us. We need to figure this out. And I came with a resolution for them to review that we would then bring to our members to ask if we could borrow money. And collectively around the room, we just felt like it wasn't sitting right with us. It just didn't feel right in our spirits. 
And, and so we're, we're discussing this and we're, we're saying, you know, I don't think we're supposed to go into debt over this. I don't think we're supposed to borrow the money. And one of our uh, leadership team members said to us, I believe that this is a great church that loves the vision. It's a great church that's enjoying and appreciating the new spaces. And they're a generous church. We should tell them they're our brothers and sisters. Let's tell them what we need. And together, let's meet this need. And so friends, I'm not, uh, the resolution is not on the table. We're believing that God, through the help of the generous people of our church, is going to help us to bridge the gap that we need right now in this financing. Some of you say, well, if we give you $700,000 now, well, what are you going to do with it? Because the government's going to give you that $700,000. And I say, yes, thank you, Lord. Because then we can finish the project and your dollars go to work again. So every dollar you give is actually like two. Because we get to use it now to keep the project moving. And then when the government funding comes in, we get to use it again for the next phase. And so friends, this is an incredible opportunity to give, to meet the crisis need, and then to also secure funding for the future. And so I'm asking you, would you consider giving? Would you consider being a part of the vision in this way? And I think leaders should go first. So I can't stand here and ask you to give without saying, what is it that I'm going to do? And so together with the leadership team, all of us together, we sat together, prayed together, believing God together, and then we individually determined what we were able to give. And I want you to know that collectively as a leadership team, we're committed to $41,000 to get us started with the project or with this funding gap. And I don't share that with you for your applause, but more for you to know that we're serious we're not asking you to exercise your faith. We're saying, let's exercise our faith. Let's do it together. And I believe that there are some in here that can give significantly to help meet this need and keep the projects, not just this one, but the next phase going. And we need to finish. Why? Because once we get finished here, we can get back out to the further mission of what's waiting for us beyond and so we haven't stopped doing our outreach, but we have churches to plant. We have campuses to plant. We have places that we need to go, and we need to get this part done so that we can go and do that. I know you're hearing me today. Normally in Heart for the House, we get about $300,000, which is fantastic. But the truth is, friends, we need to more than double that. And so I believe that God is going to show you what you can give. That's what I believe. Um, I believe if you ask him, everyone who's willing, that he'll show you. And he'll tell you exactly what you can give. And really, it's the only thing I ask. I just ask that you lay it before the Lord. And you just say, Lord, what are you asking me to do? And then just simply obey that. That's all. And if we all do that, this need will be met. I'm confident of it. I'm confident of it. And I promise if you give more than 700000 I'll come back and say, friends, that's enough. That's enough, okay? Stop giving, right? I want to say that. Can you imagine? Oh, my goodness. You know, I, I'm, I'm just to, to, at a point now where I believe that I can trust you with the Holy Spirit to speak to you, you know? Um, here's, the, here's a picture for you. In 1932, this is our church, only been alive for, you know, just over a, just under a, a decade. It was uh, the Great Depression. It was a terrible time in our nation. Did you know that the Great Depression hit Canada even harder than the U.S.? People were surviving by going to bread lines. They were getting gas ration coupons. I did my homework on this. And it was in the middle of that where our pastor, uh, C.M. Ward, was receiving less than $2 a day to live on. It was a significant time of concern and need. And during that time, our church acquired an outstanding debt, a debt that they couldn't pay, a financial obligation that was beyond their ability. And so uh, in, in one of our historical documents in our archive, um, we found an article about the church's meeting and the board got together and said, we've got to do something about this. So they wrote a letter and they gave that letter to the church folks. And they said, we, we've tried very diligently 
to steward the money well, but we have come up short. We're $200 uh, in debt. And that doesn't seem terribly significant to us now, but during that time, that was a mountain. They had no idea how to climb it. And so they did something. They said on December 18th, just a week before Christmas, really, uh, we're going to take a self-denial offering and ask you to give and help us clear off that debt. Friends, a self-denial offering. When I read that, that really stuck with me. That's not a phrase we use. I try to tell you all the benefits of giving. (laughs) I try to tell you God's worth it. I try to tell you that it's good for you, that it brings you joy. All that's true. But these folks just said, this is going to be hard. This is going to cost us something. We're going to have to deny ourselves, take up our cross, follow Jesus. We're going to have to give, and it's going to hurt a little bit. And so I reflected on that. 1932, I thought, wonder what kind of impact that had on their Christmas. I wonder what they had for Christmas dinner that year. I wonder what presents were never bought. I I wonder what furniture or livestock or household goods were sold in order to make that happen. And and I just felt that it was rightfully called a self-denial offering. And it makes me reflect. As a church that's been handed that legacy, how do we now give a self-denial offering? What does that look like for me? What does that look like for you? Is it one less present for the kids this Christmas because we're going to give that $1,000 in the offering? Is it, I'm going to take my lunch to work for the rest of the year because I want to give? Is it coffee at home instead of Starbucks? You know, is, it, is there something that I can sell? Or maybe for some of you, you're going to be surprised that there's just extra money. And you're not sure why. I'll tell you why. God has a plan. God has a plan. That happened to to me and Lisa. We're looking in our bank account and there's extra money. And we thought, we better not spend it because they might ask us for it back, right? (laughs) They might ask ask us to give it back. And then we traced it back and we saw where it came from and it's to the glory of God and it certainly is extra money and it's what we're able to, it's part of what we're able to do. So God has his ways, friends. But the Apostle Paul encouraged the church in Corinth this way. He said, now, finish the work. And I feel like, yes, Lord, can we just finish the work? Can we just be done with the construction? 10 years, let's be done with the construction. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness, there's that word again, to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. And there it is again. If we all just give what we have to give, God will get the glory, the church will move forward, Heart for the house will be more successful than it has ever been, and we'll be able to say, thank you, God, for all your goodness. So here's what I'd like you to do. Just remain seated for a moment. Seated for a moment. I'm going to ask Luke to come, and he's going to sing a song. And during this song, I want you to consider this a moment of worship. And I know for myself, the Lord often will speak to me as I'm worshiping. And so I want to invite you into worship with Luke as he sings this song. And just do that one simple thing. Ask the Lord, God, what do you want me to give? And then just obey him. If you're here with your spouse, maybe you want to take their hand, pray together, let the Lord confirm that among you. If you're here by yourself, just let the Lord speak to you. And between now and the end of the year, what is it that you could give for Heart for the House? And let's do that to the glory of God. Luke, lead us. And church, let's lay our lives before the Lord in reflection for just a moment. Take my life and let it be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee Take my moments and my days Let them flow in ceaseless prayer Swift and beautiful for 
Would you stand with me and let's pray. Father in heaven, at the end of these three weeks of celebration, we, we pause and once again say thank you for a hundred years of blessing and ministry. Thank you for the heritage, the legacy that's been handed to us. And thank you, Lord, that even today, you still want to guide us with your spirit. You still want to cover us, bless us, fill us, renew us, refresh us. You want to provide a, a cloud cover by day and a pillar of fire by night. Lord, you desire to lead us, and we trust you in that. And we just pray now, Lord God, as we consider the future, that you would make us people who invest and build a legacy, something that lasts longer than we do. Lord, we recognize this, uh, the, the confluence, the connection, the connectivity between heart for the house and this particular moment of need. And we say, Lord, you in your divine will and plan brought these two together. I believe it's your divine purpose now through your church to receive the glory as we give. Take what we give and multiply it. Multiply it to go further than we ever thought it could. Multiply it, Lord, in blessing back into our own lives. And help us, Lord, to be people who are not afraid, not afraid of self-denial for the glory of the Lord. We choose to take up our cross and follow you. That includes denying ourselves. And so we give you glory and honor in these moments, and we praise you for the, the blessing that's coming into the church now as we commit to preparing the dwelling of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.